In those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the multitude, because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their own houses, they will faint on the way, for some of them have come from afar. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The miracles of Jesus are incomprehensible to reason and experience. No one can take seven loaves and a few small fish and feed some 4,000 households. It's really impossible and even absurd. And that's how the disciples responded. From Matthew's account, the disciples said to him, where could we get enough bread in the wilderness to fill such a great multitude? Jesus doesn't follow the rules of nature or the economy of earthly life. In this world, it's always one for one, this for that. The appropriate amount of food for the appropriate amount of people. You only get what you put in. Matter cannot be created or destroyed. As a congregation of Christ's church and as your pastor, I think it would be the most blessed problem. Imagine if the Holy Spirit chose to gather to us thousands to hear God's word proclaimed here. What would we do? Would we whine and complain about how we don't have the means to accommodate so many coming to us? And no doubt we'd start crunching the numbers in despair of our church building, that it would be too small, or the parking lot, the streets and the fields, not even being able to accom accommodate the number. And most definitely, we'd have nowhere near enough volunteers. It's not possible, you think, for the Spirit to do such a thing. We could never accomplish it. But such is the economy of the Christian church. I'm reminded of a small congregation in a suburb of Berlin. Maybe you know this story. And Pastor Martins was there. And because of the manipulated, forced, or otherwise immigration into Germany, they ended up with many uh, Muslim immigrants in and around Berlin. These immigrants began to see visions of Jesus, calling them to this Lutheran congregation outside of Berlin, a small congregation, less than 100 typically on a Sunday like this. Now a congregation has grown by the Spirit, many of these who visited converting, numbering in the thousands. Went from less than 100 to a few thousand in just a few short years could blame it on the politics of Germany, or you could say it was the work of the Holy Spirit. And they thankfully rose to the challenge, Spirit giving them the gifts needed. You see how the economy of the Christian church really is impossible and absurd. But again, impossible and absurd only by our reason and our own expectations and experience. And really that means then to say it's impossible or absurd is it's actually the voice of unbelief speaking. That's because Jesus' kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, the Christian church, is not governed by the world's thoughts of what is right and wrong, good and evil, that knowledge gained from that tree in the garden. Jesus' kingdom is not governed by power and wealth. It doesn't mimic the way we tried to build community, our poor attempts of providential care for the needy and the poor and the sick. Fundamentally, it can't behave the same way, the world can't, because Christ's kingdom is built by a very different word, the word of Jesus. That same word that we heard today made all things and kept making and keeps making out of nothing. So Jesus is the word of the Father that says, let there be, and then there is. We say that matter can't be created or destroyed, but yes, it can, and only by God the creator.
So, a little break. In this Christian church, God the Father speaks his son, Jesus, the word, to continually make all things new. He is doing, even now, what for you and me cannot be done. It's impossible and absurd for some 4,000 to follow after Jesus for three days into the wilderness. Why would they dare to do such a thing? It's impossible and absurd for them to believe that Jesus would take care of them even in that desolate place in that wilderness. How could they even believe that? And even if Jesus did accomplish that, it's impossible and absurd that one man could feed so many with so little. And that's the point. It's far past the point of reason and experience. Again, the economy of the Christian church, Christ's kingdom, does not mimic the kingdoms of this world. Your king, Jesus, demands nothing of you, but gives you everything as a free gift of his goodness and mercy. Good luck finding another kingdom that behaves that way. The gospel shows us that Christ Jesus is a gracious and merciful benefactor, always eager to help and accompany and associate with everyone. And for this reason, the people were also eager to accompany him, to follow him, to observe and listen to him, so that even their houses and the streets were emptied of people. Better to be in church. So wherever he turned, whether it was up the mountain or into the wilderness, or over the sea, they followed. They were not bothered by the difficulty of the journey or how strenuous the hike was up the mountain or how perilous the waves and winds were upon the sea. In this world, the great, mighty, and rich are eager to avoid such thoughts about a multitude of poor people. Well, that's so you can have peace and quiet. But Christ Jesus does not do that. These are precisely who he cares for, he has compassion for. Jesus is even willing to have his peace robbed of him so that the poor will not be neglected concerning salvation. That's why to your family and friends and neighbors, all the time and effort and wealth that you spend to preserve God's word here and the gifts of his forgiveness, it seems to them an extraordinary waste. Your offering subsidy of a Lutheran day school makes no sense when you look at the numbers. The care and upkeep of this historic sanctuary, dedicated to really only one purpose, the reception of God's word and sacraments, that doesn't make sense either. Why couldn't we just meet in the gymnasium and let the church building just rot away? Or even think about the way that they think of the hours you pray and confess and sing daily living in the forgiveness of sins. Think about all the other ways you could use that time. And I could go on. It's all absurd. The amount of time, effort, and wealth that we seemingly squander on this congregation and on growing in the faith, it is absurd to reason and experience. But maybe we just think a little too small. Or rather, maybe we think that we are too small for God's effort. We don't dare God to give us more because we don't believe that he would then also give us what we would need. And so when he gives us little, we think God a miser. Why aren't there more people in church today? As if it's some judgment against us too. If only we were doing the right things in the eyes of the kingdom of this world or in the eyes of our sinful flesh, then the multitudes will come out to the proverbial wilderness two miles north of Random Lake. But neither of those ideas are true. We're not to apply the worldly kingdom rules to Christ's kingdom. Christ Jesus will do what he desires when and where he pleases. The Spirit blows when and where he wills. But Jesus has given you promises. And Jesus promises his Spirit will call, gather, enlighten, and sanctify you and the whole Christian church on earth and keep you with him. And in this Christian church, he promises that he will daily and richly provide you with everything needed for faith and life, forgiveness of sins and daily bread. 
Yes, daily bread is given to everyone even without their prayers. Clearly, the 4,000 believe that. But we are given to see that everything we have been given is a gift from God, from his gracious, merciful hands. That's why we can say thanks regardless of what he gives, whether it is much, 4,000 households, or whether it's little, just seven loaves and a few fishes. Either way, we have his promises and his word cannot fail. To reason and experience such faith is impossible and even absurd. We believe that God will provide for us because we trust him and cling to his word. And his word stands firm. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. It is God's ordering that we Christians first pray, attend divine service, listen to preaching and teaching, be forgiven in his body and blood, praise and thank God, and after that, proceed to our work and home. We see how the 4,000 households were so fervent and eager for God's word that they even stayed with the Lord Christ for three days, even as he led them out into a desolate place. And there he provided for them. And of course, too, we should treat our neighbor as Christ treats us, as faithful disciples, distributing as the Lord has given, not ungrateful or ungracious. Our neighbors, be they a few dozen or a few thousand, are gifts to us, too, from the Lord's loving and gracious hands. Even creation confesses that. The field cries out, Behold, O man, I give you grain for food. Even the vineyard sings, I give you wine for your drink, without you asking. Even the sheep says, here's wool for your clothing. Only judgment comes upon those who do not show mercy, as they've been shown mercy. So we are called not to abuse the good things that we've received from God, or shamefully squander them, that's true, to take them and use them, keep them with care to enjoy them with moderation, thank God for them, and use them to help our neighbor. But it doesn't need to be according to a ledger sheet, according to a balanced budget. It doesn't have to make any economic sense. But it's by love, according to need, trusting that the Lord will continue to provide for that need. If it does make economic sense to you, the mercy and mission work of the church, you're probably thinking about them all wrong. That's not how Christ's kingdom behaves. Even though God gives all things richly and sufficiently, our sinful hearts and the world tends to one of two extremes. Either it, it keeps them so that no one can enjoy them with the barns you'll hear about, or it abuses and squanders them so that they're no good to anyone, wasting what God has given said, we're called to be different, as the Spirit has given us to be. said, we're called to thank God for all his benefits, to be gracious and merciful toward our neighbor, to help him serve and counsel him, and to trust that God will continue to provide for that need. And Jesus promises us that we will hear these comforting words when he does come again. Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom that is prepared for you from the beginning of the world. For whatever you did to these, my lowliest brethren, you did it unto me. And then we all will enter into the wedding feast, into eternal life. May God strengthen our faith and keep us with Jesus today and always. In his holy name. Amen. Amen.